Could security services have stopped the suicide bomber who killed 22 people at a concert? After three long years, the families of the 22 victims of the Manchester Arena bombing could finally get an answer to that question today. The final report into the terrorist attack will be published later, detailing what was known about the bomber years before he killed and maimed. What we want to hear is that, I guess not only that there's been lessons learned, that there's going to be something done about it, because we've had four, five years now of navel gazing. Also this lunchtime, he said, she said, the politician and the journalist accusing each other of betrayal over the leaked Covid messages. Jailed for manslaughter, the pedestrian who told a cyclist to get off the pavement, causing her to fall and get hit by a car. Boris Johnson says he'll find it very difficult to vote for the Prime Minister's new Brexit deal. And... <laughs> now, Alex the Husky survived 23 days without food, water and sunlight after the Turkey earthquakes. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Nina Hussain. Good afternoon. Could the Manchester Arena bomber have been stopped? And will we find out the answer to that in the next hour? After a three-year inquiry at two o'clock today, the third and final report into the terrorist attack in 2017 will be published. It'll focus on what happened before that night, how MI5 was aware of Salman Abedi seven years before he detonated a bomb at a concert, killing 22 people. In a big day for Manchester and all those impacted by the attack, Charlotte Cross on what we can expect. It's been more than 2,000 days since the suicide bombing at Manchester Arena. Hundreds were injured and 22 were killed. I'm a Cottage Street super fan. Among them was 29-year-old Martin Hett. His family have sat through almost every day of the three-year inquiry into what happened that night. Today, that inquiry finally comes to a close. I think there's, in many ways, a, a bit of a relief that it's all going to come to an end. You keep sort of re-traumatising yourself about what happened. So not only have we gone through a bereavement and a, a horrific bereavement, but it keeps getting brought up again and again. The inquiry has previously looked at how bomber Salman Abedi was able to walk around the arena with the bomb on his back without being stopped by police or security. But this final report goes back further. It will look at his family who had links to Libyan Islamist militia and how he'd been in close contact with a number of people recruited to ISIS. Revealing his findings in Manchester today, Chairman Sir John Saunders will look at what MI5 knew about Abedi, what they did with that information and what they missed. Evidence in the inquiry has revealed MI5 was aware of Abedi as early as 2010. He'd been under investigation between March and July 2014 and again in October 2015. The agency received relevant intelligence about him twice in the months before the attack, but it was treated as non-terrorist criminality. And Abedi was not questioned on his return to Manchester Airport from Libya four days before he attacked. What we want to hear is that, I guess, not only that there's been lessons learned, that there's going to be something done about it, because we've had four, five years now of navel-gazing and looking at what went wrong and what people could have done better. But, you know, we need to spend some time just doing something about it now, otherwise this whole process has been to no avail. He and Martin's mother are there once again today, waiting for answers on whether 22 lives could have been saved by action taken months or even years before. Charlotte Cross, ITV News. Our North of England reporter, Rachel Townsend, is in Manchester. Rachel, uh, obviously a really difficult day for anyone impacted by the terrorist attack. 
Yeah, that's right. There is a real feeling of apprehension and of tension here in Manchester this lunchtime. Let's not forget that many who lost loved ones in this bombing have lived and breathed this inquiry since it began in September 2020. Families have had to relive the horror of that night day after day, month after month, and it is bound to have taken its toll. And we've spent time with those families. We spoke to the mother of Martin Hett, who you saw in Charlotte's report there. She told us today that the end of this inquiry won't bring them any closure. You know, they have to live with their loss every single day, and the conclusion of an inquiry or the publication of a report won't change that for them. Now, what they do want and what they are hoping for is answers. Could Salman Abedi have been stopped that night? And if so, why wasn't he? Now, yesterday we reported how the government made that announcement that they hope to provide better support for the bereaved following disasters such as this, the Hillsborough disaster, the Grenfell Tower fire. They want to ensure that the bereaved voices are better heard. Many here feel that has come too late for them, but certainly an emotional day here in Manchester. We are expecting the announcement of those findings in about half an hour's time. Rachel Townsend, thank you. And as soon as that report is published, as Rachel was saying there, around 2 o'clock this afternoon, we'll have all the details of its findings on ITVX. Just head to ITVX.com and scroll down to the news section. So the very public falling out now between the former health secretary Matt Hancock and the journalist who helped him write his memoirs. He has accused her, Isabel Oakeshott, of betrayal after she gave the Telegraph thousands of WhatsApp messages he'd sent during the pandemic. She says she makes no apology whatsoever for acting in the national interest, adding the greatest betrayal is of the entire country. So, is all this helping or hindering our understanding of the government's response to the COVID crisis? Our political reporter Amy Lewis on the latest accusations and the reaction to them. She was the ghost writer who has come back to haunt him. Isabel Oakeshott has made thousands of messages she obtained whilst working on Matt Hancock's book, Public. Mr Hancock has responded saying, I'm hugely disappointed and sad at the massive portrayal and breach of trust by Isabel Oakeshott. I was accused of sending menacing messages to Isabel. This is also wrong. I messaged to say it was a big mistake, nothing more. I'm not frightened by Matt Hancock. I think it's a little irregular, to say the least, to send messages at 1.20 in the morning saying you have made a big mistake. Mm. I'm not frightened by that, and I'm certainly not going to be intimidated by any of his other threats, including that of legal action. If he wants to take legal action, then good luck to him. She claims it was in the national interest to break a non-disclosure agreement and leak the messages. They also reveal politicians not only disagreed about the length of school closures during lockdowns, but disparaging remarks made by ministers at the time. In October 2020, Mr Hancock allegedly messaged the then Education Secretary Gavin Williamson. What a bunch of absolute arses the teaching unions are. Williamson replied, I know, they really, really do just hate work. Nick Gibb is Minister for Schools and worked closely with Williamson during the pandemic. I don't think they reflect the genuine views of either Gavin Williamson or Matt Hancock. They were said in the heat of the moment, you know, when they were taking you know, difficult decisions, there were disagreements and they would say things that they would have regretted Were afterwards. children at the time forgotten in all of the politics that was happening? Absolutely not. Ultimately, we had to make decisions based on how we tackled the virus. But the revelations will do little to improve relations with the unions, as teachers strike in parts of England and Wales today over pay. When we've got messages from government ministers calling teachers lazy and calling union leaders very rude names, I think they despise ministers for the way that they behave and the way that they think and act. It, uh, you know, this is not a government which is covering itself with glory. Gavin Williamson says the messages were about some unions and not teachers. Children lost some of the most important years of their education during the pandemic. Teachers and families say lessons need to be learned. But Matt Hancock argues that should happen in the COVID inquiry. Amy Lewis, ITV News.
A woman who told off a cyclist for riding on the pavement has been jailed today for three years after the woman fell into the road and got hit by a car. Oriel Gray was found guilty of the manslaughter of 77-year-old Celia Ward in Huntington in Cambridgeshire in 2020. Our Midlands correspondent Stacey Foster is at Peterborough Crown Court. What was said in court at today's sentencing? Well, the CCTV footage of this incident was very much at the centre of the hearing today. It was shown during the trial and Oriel Gray gesticulating and shouting and swearing um, at Celia Ward as she cycled towards her uh, on the pavement. Of course, Celia then fell into the road into the path of a vehicle and died at the scene. In court today, statements were read out from Celia's family. Her daughter said that her mother's death had been senseless and needless. And we also heard from uh, David, Celia's husband, who said that that CCTV footage haunts him forever. He said that his wife was calm, careful, kind and cheerful. And he said that she had been taken from him in the most horrific way. And Stacey, Oriel Gray's lawyers have said that they will appeal this sentence handed down today. Yes, that was the indication in court earlier today on the basis that in mitigation uh, they would be applying for bail and, and launching an appeal. In mitigation they did say that uh, it was Oriel's view that where there was a narrow pavement that cyclists should be on the road. Um, she never intended to cause any harm and she was worried about a cyclist coming towards her. Um, she has cerebral palsy but sentencing her to three years for the manslaughter of Celia Ward, the judge said that this action could not be explained by disability. The path was 2.4 metres wide and he described it as a shared path as well. Police said that this was a reminder to everyone who uses the road to treat each other fairly. Stacey Foster, thank you. Boris Johnson has said he'll find it very difficult to vote for the Prime Minister's new Brexit deal. The former Prime Minister says Rishi Sunak's deal is not about the UK taking back control, but the EU graciously unbending to allow us to do what we want to do in our own country, not by our laws, but by theirs. But he conceded he had made mistakes in signing his Northern Ireland Protocol, adding... It's all my fault. Let's get more from our political correspondent, Harry Horton, who's in Parliament. What impact could this have, first of all, on Mr Sunak's deal? Yeah, I think in the short term, it's probably likely to have quite a minimal impact. Boris Johnson himself acknowledged that his sceptical view about this Windsor framework was a minority uh, among MPs. And frankly, I don't think Boris Johnson wants to lead some sort of rebellion if he knows that it's unlikely to be successful. Interesting, as you say, that he acknowledged that his original Northern Ireland protocol... Uh, may well have caused the DUP to walk out of power-sharing government in Northern Ireland because of their perception of this trade barrier in the Irish Sea. Boris Johnson said, uh, it's all my fault, I fully accept responsibility. Uh, he also urged Rishi Sunak to back his Northern Ireland protocol bill that Rishi Sunak has said he doesn't think uh, he needs to push ahead with. I'm going to find it very difficult to vote for something myself, because uh, something like this myself, because I believed that we should have done something different. I hope that it will work. And I also hope that if it doesn't work, we will have the guts to deploy that bill again. Well, the DUP are still deciding whether to back the Windsor framework. If they were to oppose it, I think that would cause a bit of a headache for Rishi Sunak. But broadly, I think the Prime Minister will be fairly pleased with the response from MPs to his bill this week. Harry Horton, thank you very much. Still to come, evicted, Harry and Meghan told to leave Frogmore. And the remarkable rescue of the husky from the rubble of the Turkey earthquake. First, Carrie Johnson has appealed to the Justice Secretary not to allow the early release of a man who killed his wife. Robert Brown was jailed for the manslaughter of Joanna Simpson but could be freed later this year, halfway through his sentence. Last night, the former Prime Minister's wife joined Joanna's family to launch an appeal to keep her killer locked up, as Faye Barker now reports. 
Yellow Roses in Westminster Chapel, representing 123 women, all believed to have been killed by men over a year. They were laid out as a campaign was launched to stop the killer of Joanna Simpson being released from jail. Her estranged husband, Robert Brown, is almost halfway through a 26-year sentence after killing Joanna with a hammer at her Berkshire home in 2010. Their two young children nearby. He then buried her body on the Windsor Crown estate. The former British Airways pilot was acquitted of murder but admitted manslaughter and is due for automatic release later this year. We're very stressed about his release. We're anxious, very anxious, because we know what he's capable of. Supported by politicians, lawyers and campaigners, those who loved Joanna spoke of the impact his release may have and the injustice they feel. This man will be looking for revenge and he has already shown the lengths that he will go to to exact his revenge. We're terrified. Among the supporters was Carrie Johnson, the former Prime Minister's wife, part of a successful judicial review to keep black cab rapist John Warboys behind bars. She'd been targeted by him when she was 19. It's a similar injustice, another circumstance where the law was badly letting down, victims down and failing to do its job to protect women. The cause has united politicians from across the board with hope the campaign will bring change. I don't want to be here in 10 years with another avoidable murder of a woman at the hands of her partner that then receives a sentence that just isn't right or just, and certainly not what the British public would expect. We need all aspects now to come together, including the sentence inside, but also use of the legislation, the tools and the powers that the Lord Chancellor has to ensure that the release of this individual does not happen. But getting other people saying this has been awful doesn't just give us heart and strength, but now we have hope and we never thought we would have hope. The Justice Secretary Dominic Raab is due to meet Joanna's mother next week and he says he'll review the case carefully. Campaigners hoping he'll ensure her killer remains behind bars. Faye Barker, ITV News. Police are continuing to search an area in Brighton where the remains of a baby were found after a missing couple were arrested earlier this week. Constance Martin and Mark Gordon are continuing to be questioned on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter. A coroner has found a misplaced breathing tube contributed to the death of a 13-year-old boy who became the UK's first known child victim of COVID. Ishmael Mohammed Abdul Wahab died in March 2020 in a South London hospital. His family weren't allowed to be with him or attend his funeral because of COVID rules at the time. And an inquest has found the head teacher of Epsom College, Emma Patterson, died of shock, hemorrhage and shotgun wounds to the chest and abdomen. And her daughter died of a shotgun wound to the head. Both are believed to have been murdered by George Patterson, husband and father, who then killed himself. Next, why Prince Harry and Meghan will be Windsor's no more, at least when it comes to their home here. They've been asked to leave Frogmore Cottage, the house they use within the grounds of the King's Windsor Estate. Sejal Carrier joins me now. Is this an escalation of the rift within this family? Nina, some might see this as a rebuke by the King, who it's reported has sanctioned this move, coming weeks after the publication of that explosive book by Prince Harry, Spare. Others might see this as a natural progression, given that the couple have made America their home after quitting life as working royals in 2020. Buckingham Palace have decli has declined to comment, but the couple have confirmed in a statement that they have been asked to vacate the cottage that was gifted to them by Harry's grandmother, the late Queen. But all of this raises some key questions. Where will Harry and Meghan stay when they visit the UK with their permanent UK base gone? And it also raises questions about their security, given Prince Harry no longer has royal protection and he's already raised concerns about security when visiting the UK. Frogmore, remember, is located within the security perimeter of the Windsor estate. Another question, will this move further weaken their ties with the royal family and will the couple be invited to the, uh, the King's coronation in May? Now, Prince Andrew has reportedly been offered the keys to uh, Frogmore, but it's 
claimed he's resisting calls to downsize from his current home, Windsor Lodge, where he's lived for 20 years. Sergio, thank you very much. Traffic came to a standstill on the M5 near Bristol this morning after part of a lorry became wedged underneath an overhead gantry. Pictures show the back of the tipper truck stuck in an upright position above the road. Thankfully, no one was injured. Finally, three weeks on from the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, there is little good news to bring you, but a rescue has emerged that is likely to put a smile on your face. Teams have managed to pull a dog out of the rubble. Alex the Husky has survived 23 days without food, water or sunlight. Bybra Holmes has his remarkable story. They crawl through the dirt and the dust in hope of the almost unbelievable. Alex! Life detected deep under the ruins of a shattered home. This is Alex. He has survived over three weeks without food or water, trapped under the rubble caused by the earthquake that has devastated so much of Turkey and Syria. Coaxed, then carried out by his rescuers and given much needed water, food and cuddles. They are volunteers working with HITAP an animal welfare NGO that has rescued hundreds of pets like Alex. Everybody has lost everything, their homes, their lives, their future, even their, you know, uh, past. They lost everything. When you find something, especially when you find something alive, it's a hope for them, you know. It's not just a dog. It's not just a cat when you find it. It's dangerous and difficult work, but the smiles on the team's faces show it's worth it. Barbara Holmes, ITV News. Isn't it? That's all from me. Bye-bye.